So let's wait for a slide, but yeah. First, it's really nice to be here and I'm thankful to be invited to speak here today. So why am I speaking about smart contract security? Um, could be seen as a bit ironic for some, but actually I've worked for Ethereum since yeah, two, over two years now. And actually my job was to prevent hard forks, so to say. Because I was working on consensus tests and working on getting all the clients to sync and wrote thousands of tests and would be so bold to say that I prevented a lot of hard forks in the sense of client consensus. Um, and now through recent experiences, I learned the hard way um, how important smart contact, smart contact security is and that's why I wanted to talk about it today. Let's see, so you know about the DAO. Um, I was mainly responsible for writing the DAO smart contract. So on 17th of June, you, there was an attack robbing 3.5 million Ether out of this smart contract by using the re-entry exploit. Um, we have heard about this before this conference, so I will not go into details how this works. But those were the lines of code in the DAO itself. Um, basically, there was this one function with Straw Reward, with straw reward 4, which was vulnerable to this exploit. So, what can we learn from all of this? There's a lot of things that have been said yesterday. And I mean, um, I will repeat some of them, of course, but give my personal perspective on some of those things. First of all, cap smart contracts. Um, it's very early days and we lack experience, meaning we just need to learn some lessons before to know which kind of bugs we can do. If you just look at the version numbers of the current software, you can get a feeling of how early it is. Some Solidity actually has not been released yet as a 1.0 version. Um, Frontier has been launched for about a year ago, so it's all very early days. We have a, the number of operating decentralized applications is also still very low. Um, Vitalik suggested in a blog post that, for example, right now a cap of about $10 million seems about right. Um, it's, an, it, it's an individual decision, but of course, would have been nice if the DAO would have had such a cap, um, but of course nobody did know that it would rise to such a size. So, next one. Formal proof verification, I will not go into this. We have heard about a lot of this yesterday, but yes, very important topic. I hope we make, to con make continuous progress on this topic. Invariant checks. So basically you can write see that your smart contract has certain invariants such as for the DAO, this would have been that the total supply is smaller than the balance plus reward tokens. And then after every function, um, you can check if the invariants still hold. It reduces, of course, the risk. Then this is an interesting topic, centralization. Of course, we want to build decentralized application. That's our main goal. And one of the weaknesses, so to say, of the DAO was that it was really decentralized, that we had no control, nobody had any control over it. And this was the problem in the, in the end, because nobody could save the DAO, um, uh, only the community, by doing a hard fork, which, of, of course, is a horrible option to do. So we need to go stepwise from centralization to decentralization. If you think about Ethereum, we had Olympic testnet, then we had the Frontier testnet, where we had those canaries, I had one of those keys, where basically two out of four key holders could more or less switch off the miners um, if they would listen to the canaries. We had have Homestead, where we have this difficulty increase, which means we need to have a hard fork in about a year or so. And there's only a couple of people able to code up the next version of Ethereum, so it's also kind of centralized still. And we will go step to step to more decentralization. Um, for the DAO, there have been curators. They have been a, given a lot of power, except of the function split DAO, because this was a function meant to, as a fail safe for malicious curators. So that's why I didn't have control over this function, couldn't do anything. There's all the other DAOs, Stitcher DAO, Maker DAO, and other DAOs in the progress, which start centralized and will go into decentralization. Then the question is, of course, who can control? For a DAO, it was some token holders. It could be central trusted authorities, and there is more, but the slides don't show it up here right now. But it could be something like a community multisig. It could be something like a stake vote that you build in something your smart contract when a certain amount of Ether holders vote for it, stop something. So there are certain ways of controlling this. But I think we need to go step by step. But also, I think it's important that we really want to build decentralized application and do not use the DAO as an excuse to only build centralized applications, although it's 
good to start like this. I don't think it should end like this. We should move forward to full decentralization one day. Okay, let's see if this works, yeah. Established security patterns, meaning learning. We didn't know about the call stack depth attack. Call stack depth attack. We know about the block gas limit. We don't have arbitrary length loops. Um, we know about the anti exploit now. We know about that Ether sent to a contract without, is it, it's possible to send Ether to a contract without any contract invocation. So even if you use this modifier payable, um, or you don't use it in any function, you try to avoid getting Ether as a contract, you cannot avoid it because you can use the suicide opcode to transfer Ether to a contract without executing any code, for example. Um, specify the right amount of gas, send versus call, depending on what you exactly you want to do. You have to be careful with the block timestamp because it can be manipulated. Transaction origin versus ma message sender, for example, can be used for phishing attacks and much more. And actually, it's bad that the slides are not really working because there are links coming up. It's just um, there are some very good resources. One is from the consensus website, best smart contractors, best, pract um, best practice of smart contracts or something like this. You find on the consensus website, it's a really nice overview of all the things we, we need to learn and what we have learned up to now. Also, the Solidity documentation has a section about um, security consideration, which is very good and very helpful. And we should, as a community, learn and put all those things together so we can teach other developers what to look out for. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. Mm, yes, updatable contracts. So the DAO had a possibility of updating the contract through a vote. It did take a uh, two weeks debating time and the DAO 1.1, so to say, was work in progress, but it was too late. So it is I would advise you when, you're smart when, when you write smart contracts to have an option to update them. The question is only who can update them. In the beginning, it can be you, of course, centralized. It can be the token holders if you have some in your application, depending on what you're building. And again, could be a multi-sig, maybe a community multi-sig, there are different ways of doing this, but it's important to have at least this option of being able to update um, contracts. Time delays are also something important. When you, when someone can restore Ether or take Ether out of a smart contract, if you have a time delay, this gives an option if you implemented some authority to do something to act. In case of the DAO, there was no such authority, and the least resort was this, ha this awful hard fork. So, therefore, if you have time delays and this authority implemented, then this can work nicely together to reduce the risk of your smart contract. Of course, minimal complexity. Um, there are statistics out there which saying there are 15 up to 50 bucks per thousand lines of code. For a website, it's okay, you can fix it, but for a smart contract, it's really bad. So, of course, we need a much, much more security for smart contracts than we need for normal stuff. So this also means not everything needs decentralization and needs to be in a smart contract. Only put in what you really need, the core elements of a decentralized application. Everything else can be maybe in Swarm, Whisper, or even other techniques. Yeah, and the other thing is to reuse trusted proven code. This can also be dangerous, but for example, the standard token contract, which was also used in the DAO, which worked just nice. Um, you have the foundation multisig, which seems to hold up till now. So means also looks safe. And maybe there will be even a DAO standard framework one day, just to reusable, safe code. This also comes with a danger, because if then you someone finds a bug in this kind of code, it will affect a lot of applications. So therefore, you also need to be careful with those things. But I think we as a community need to build trusted libraries, which are reviewed by many of us, to for other developers to use. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. Yeah, better tools. You have heard about form proof verification. We need better compiler warnings. Um, I think this is all work in progress. We need improved IDEs. We have seen Remix last yesterday, which looks really nice and promising. Um, we need trusted libraries. We need best practices literature, which is also work in progress. And we also may need some yeah, the centralization, which can be done by master keys, or maybe maybe we can do decentralized with escape hatches or other things, which we can use in smart contracts for now as, so to say, a trusted source of information who can update contracts or do certain things or stop a contract from working. 
So as a conclusion, I would say it is very early days and we all need to be very, very careful. Um, but I think there is, of course, a lot of lessons to be learned from this. But uh, being here the last couple of days got me really excited to see what came out of this. We have a lot of security experts from academics. We have a lot of media attention, a lot of people looking at this, looking at the right things, developers being much more careful now. And it was also nice to see a lot of developers coming up to me and say, um, you basically saved my project because I had the same bug in there, but I could fix it now. And so I think a lot of future applications, decentralized applications and smart contracts will avoid all of these issues. And we can really move into a bright future, although being careful in the beginning. And it was really astonishing for me to see how this community is moving on. I think this was a really nice ex um, experience to talk to many of you the last couple of days. And I also want to say a personal thank you. I mean, the last couple of months. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it has. Yeah, I, I can only really say thank you. The last couple of months have been as a, pers as a person for me in my personal life, also as a company, Hobo, of course. But it's only because of the people sitting here, because of the lot of the Ethereum community, that I can stand here today and give this talk. And I just want to say thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> also, thank you. Thank you. Really, thank you.